highways and the byways. Look in the cities and the towns. Look in the neighborhoods and the inner cities. Look in the mountains and the foothills. There are nearly four million lost people in our beloved state of Tennessee. And without Jesus Christ, those four million will enter into a Christless eternity. Look around, friend. Look around, fellow believer. There's lostness all around us. But I say, let it be us. Let it be us who tells Tennessee that Jesus is the answer. Oh, I know it looks bleak, and I know there's a lot of lost folk, but let it be us who tells Tennessee Jesus still saves because we believe he can save. Why, he can save the atheist and the agnostic. He can save the broken and the burdened. He can save the disenfranchised, the uninterested, the uninformed, the unfortunate, the carefree, the demon-possessed, the addict, the prostitute, the down and out, the up and up, the businessman, the student, the professional. Why, he can save anybody who will call upon his name let it be us who goes with the conviction to tell Tennessee that Jesus still saves armed with this conviction that our God saves let it be us that launches out into the lostness of our beloved state God has called us to this mission he didn't call someone else from somewhere else for some other time he called me he called you the mission is great, the stakes are high, but we will succeed. We'll succeed because our Lord has paid the price. He bore the cross. He died in our place. He rose from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of Father, Father of majesty on high. He lives and he reigns and he ever intercedes for the saints. He still saves today.
Oh my God. 
You know God likes to use broken things. This has become one of my favorite songs because it's, it's called Broken Vessels and it just talks about God just using us who were broken at one time and he puts us back together. And he makes this beautiful uh, situation between us and him. So as we sing this, it's worship.
instead of raising up the broken to life. Man, it's good. Is there anything our God can do? Is there any time he'll let us down? Is there any battle you're facing that he ain't already won? Listen, I know one thing that God will do is he'll never stop loving you. The Bible says that I am convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor demons nor principalities nor rulers nor any dark forces on this earth or in heaven or whatever will separate us from the love of God. That's good stuff. It means you can't run that fast. There's nowhere you can go that he ain't going to be there. And there's nothing you can try that he's going to look at you and love you any different. Listen, my God will not fail. Amen. As we sing this song, this is a proclamation for all those Christians in the room. There ain't nothing that he won't do. Yeah. 
Lord, I'm so glad that I cannot walk without you holding my
just converts it into a, a, a mental video of color. I see colors. When music goes, I see color. And if I match the color, I just, I got on the right note. That's how I figured it out. You know, this is a normal thing. And she looked at me and said, honey, it ain't normal. <laughs> so I, 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 I went, it made me explore just a little bit. And, and digging through, I learned that it's called chromesthesia. Chromesthesia. It, and it really means exactly that. Whenever my, uh, whenever my ears hear music, the brain converts it into a, a mental video of colors, and it's all sorts of colors, and, and gradients, and textures, and all sorts of different things, and, and so that, that's how I kind of I got over that, and so once we, once we got pitch all fixed and established, he took me for my first singing, introduced me to the rest of the quartet, and, uh, and, and we just, we, we clicked, they let me, my voice hadn't changed, so I got to sing the high tenor part in a court, old quartet song um, called Winging My Way Back Home. Uh, down deep in my soul, a melody rings. And it's not, some of you say you can't you've heard that song. And that, that was the first song that I ever sang in a Southern Gospel Quartet. And, and they started letting me travel with them. And that first year I traveled with them, we did over 75 concerts. It was unbelievable. Because I was still going to school <laughs> Monday through Friday. And, um, and, and I traveled about three or four years with those guys before I really started going... Um, on my, on my own and doing solo things. And traveling with, the, traveling with a bunch of old people for all that time, I learned that I love old people. I really do. I think you get to a certain age and you just don't care anymore. <laughs> if you think it, you're going to say it, you know. And after a few minutes, you're going to forget it and say it again. <laughs> oh, gracious. That, that it reminds me, um, uh, Owen Jordan was the bass singer of the group. And he was the craziest old man I ever met in my life. Owen Jordan. It felt like Jordan, but we're in the South. So you say Jordan. Owen Jordan. He told me this. He said years ago, he was sitting in, at home in the recliner in the, in the living room watching TV. And, uh, and the, a rain, a just heavy thunderstorm came through. And I mean, the rain was just pouring down like crazy. Pouring down. And in the middle, in the midst of that, a knock happens at the door. And he gets up wondering who in the world in the right mind is out here in this weather. And he goes to the door and he opens it up. And there stands his mother-in-law, soaking wet. I mean, the rain was just beating on her. I said, what'd you do? He said, well, we just stood there for a couple minutes looking at each other. I said, I did what'd you do? He said, well, finally, I looked her up and down and I said, don't just stand there. Go home. <laughs> That's not it. I made that up. That ain't true. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 2010, at this point, the quartet, they were staying busy, busy, um, and, and I, had, uh, two, I had about three CDs under my belt, and I was doing a lot of solo dates, and my, my grandmother was taking me everywhere, um, and, and, uh, and my grandfather started having some troubles, Paul started having troubles. And he went to his doctor. He'd already had two heart attacks. And um, he went into the doctor and told him what was going on. His doctor said, I, I don't like what I'm hearing. We need, that. we need to do an emergency a heart cap. We need to do an ASAP. I'm going to get you in on Friday and uh, we'll get that done. And my grandfather looked at him and said, I can't do Friday. I have an eye appointment. <laughs> And he kept that eye appointment. He went to, he went to the eye doctor. Um, which, you know, it's amazing to me, these little things that happen that are, are most definitely blessings from God. Because that weekend was uh, Easter. It was Easter Sunday that weekend. And I had nowhere to sing. I wasn't booked to go anywhere. And the quartet was not booked to go anywhere. They didn't have anywhere to sing. And so that meant we all got to go as a family to church, our home church together on Easter Sunday 2010. And so we did. And of course, you know, when the weights come into the building, everybody goes, what you singing? <laughs> it's just an automatic thing. What are you singing? And so we got up there and, uh, and I sang a song, a Rodney Griffin song called uh, He's My Savior. And Paul Paul sang the harmony with me. And then he sang a Ray Bolt song called Feel the Nails. Does he still feel the nails every time? And, and I sang the harmony. Not knowing that that would be the last time we would sing together. 
Monday morning comes early. We get to the hospital. They check him in. They get him prepped. They bring us into this small room before they take him back. And, and our pastor's there. Um, and he's praying. And I'll never forget this. The pastor looked at, at us and said, we have to remember Deuteronomy. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. And they took him back, brought us to a waiting room where we sat for ever. And when the doctor finally came out, he walked in a slow pace with a, um, a blank stare on his face. And he begins to tell us that the heart cath was successful, uh, but there was a lot of blockage and they, they felt that they needed to put a stent in. And as they were putting that stent in, what they didn't realize was that his arteries were so weakened couldn't hold it, and the stent pierced through and went straight through his heart. It was so bad, they couldn't move him from the table at all. He, had to, he was laying on the table for, uh, for three days. They couldn't move him. And finally, on that, on that third day, uh, they, they cleared the hallways, they cleared the elevators, and I don't know how they did this, but they got him from the third floor, uh, I mean, from the, from the first floor in that, in that OR room, all the way up to that third floor and I see you in under a minute they got him up there. And I watched as my grandfather as my Paul Paul fought for his life for that week. And on the last night, his sister came. She's the oldest of them, wonderful pianist. And she looked at me and said, come with me. And we went back there. And she got up. She got on his right side and I got on his left side. And I watched, she took his hand and she would, she would stroke his hand and then she put her hand up on his cheek. She looked at me and she said, I think you should sing him a song. And I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything. She said, son, you better start singing or I will. And before I knew it, she took off. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And that night he passed. And I look back on that, and I often wonder, and he took his last breath and he closed his eyes for the final time. Did they reopen to the face of Jesus? And from his mouth he proclaimed, Then sings my soul, How great thou art! How great thou art! And I've, I've looked at this all of my life, this singing, I've been doing this for the majority of my life. I'm, I'm 33, about to be 34 years old. Um, this is all that I've done. And if I'm honest, I'm, I'm pretty confident this is going to be the only thing I'll ever do. <laughs> I love this. And those years after losing him, I, I really spent a lot of time reflecting and looking back and, and realizing the baton that was passed to me to take this on um, and, and this, this responsibility, this, 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 uh, this heaviness at times, and, and go and tell the world that Jesus saves. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. It's not. But I feel sure, confident, with zero doubt, that this is what God has called me to do. And the last three, four years, it's it's been a little bit, it's been a little chaotic. Can we agree on that? It's, it's been a lot of turmoil, a lot of weirdness, a lot of evilness. And as I, as I look around and I, and I see that they outside look at us as believers and they, they, they're, they're beginning this thing of, shh, you need to be tolerant. You need to be quiet. Don't be so stuck in your ways. Let my truth be my truth. And you know what really got me? is how many churches sat down and got quiet. How many churches closed their doors for the last time because they just couldn't, they couldn't sustain. 
And so now, going through that lockdown and all of that stuff, man, I, I've, I've come out with this, uh, this vigor, this charge in me, and, and this fire in my belly that, that, that says, you know, no matter what, I am not going to sit down or shut up. I'm going to proclaim the gospel of Christ to as many people as I can. And what I ask, because I know I'm in a room full of pastors in here, I ask that, that I'm, I'm, I'm challenging myself, and now I'm challenging you too. Let's proclaim with boldness. Let the church be the church. And no matter what the outside world does or says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we have an almighty God who fight. We sang it just a little bit ago. He fights our battles for us. All we have to do is be like Jehoshaphat. Show up. Show up and do what God has called us to do. Do what we're called to do. This song here, um, I think it's the anthem of the church. I know a lot of people look to uh, songs like Amazing Grace, and I think that's an amazing song. But this one here really solidifies for me, lyrically, the anthem of the believer. And, and it, if I could leave you with anything, it would be hope as a believer. Hope to know that under the blood of the Lamb, you have been washed. Your sins have been paid for. And the, the, the chains, the bondage that have held you for so long, no longer applies. You are set free through the Holy One of Israel. When in peace, like a river, attendeth my or when songs like sea billows flow, whatever my life thou hast taught me to say.
Uh, Mary and I are there usually, well, Mary more than I, but I'm in and out all the time. But Mary and I are usually there Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So my phone number's on the door, so if you need me, you can call me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My phone stays on, and I do get calls, and, and I'm, I'm thankful that I can answer them. Uh, I know a bunch of you. My name, my face, and I'm glad you're here tonight. And thank you for it. But we uh, represent 22 churches, in more, uh, 20 in Warren County, and two in Van Buren. And uh, we hope to have an event like this uh, a little later in Van Buren. So uh, we'll be praying about that for, for our churches up there. We get together with them after this is over. But, um, thank you again. Uh, let's let's give another big round of applause for the praise team and for. And for Ben Blades. Ben's got a table back here when you go out. It's got a cookbook on it. My wife, my wife. She, she likes the cookbook. And uh, and he's got some of his CDs. And I've got them too. Love to listen to them. So uh, we're excited about what's going on here tonight. We thank you for coming. And uh, we're about to wrap this up here. Without any further hindrance, we're going to call on my brother Rock Collins to come and bring God's word to us. Brother Jim, thank you so much. What a privilege. What a privilege to be here. I am honored and humbled for the opportunity to stand before you. I love our time of worship tonight. It has just been wonderful to be here. And uh, one of these sweet days when we get to heaven, and you all are wondering who those two guys are running. It will be me and Ben. So leave us alone. Amen. <laughs> I love Ben Wade. He is my brother. He and Natalie are precious to my soul. And I thank God for them. For being your blessing. I'm looking forward to running the streets of gold with you. I'm so honored to have my sweet wife here. Gerald, just wave your hand, Gerald. This is my wife right here. Fred Luger says, he's my prime real. Amen. <laughs> if you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. You can pull me down just a little bit up here. Uh, Mark chapter 10. I'm going to begin to read in verse 17. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. And I'm going to invite you, if you have your Bible or not, I'm, I'm not asking, but I am asking, would you stand in reference to the reading of God's Word? Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus Beholding him, loved him, and he said to him, One thing thou likest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you for your word. We know that it is strong and powerful. And we know your word is living. And God, I pray tonight that you would preach your word to us. May you just dismiss me and set me off to the side. And dear God, let us hear from heaven tonight. You know every heart in this place. You know every need, every burden, every situation. And God, I pray that you would preach directly to the hearts tonight. God, may you not only speak to us corporately, but may you speak to us individually. Preach to us tonight. And 
God, I pray that it would please you to preach to the end that somebody would get saved. Lord, that somebody would be free tonight. Lord, I pray you would preach. And I would that all the praise, honor, and glory might be credited to Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. You may be saved. How do you respond when you encounter Jesus? How do you respond when you encounter Jesus? The Bible tells us that Jesus had gone forth into the way. It means he's walking, if you will. He's walking down the road. And there came one who was running after him. And he kneeled down to him, showing him respect. And he said, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This is not a unique question for Lee. We live in a day where people still want to know the answer. What do I have to do to have eternal life? What do I have to do to have a life that lasts forever? Because we recognize that this earthly body will die. It's appointed once for man to die. Every one of us will die. But what happens next? I submit to you, there is a next. And you will spend it somewhere. Uh, we dream and long to have eternal life in a place called heaven in the presence of Almighty God, who is indeed good. But there is another option. You can choose to reject the Lord Jesus and go to a place called hell for eternity. This young man comes running after Jesus and he said, I want eternal life. I want to know how to have the best forever. It's interesting to me that Jesus responds first, not to his question, but he responds first to what he called him. He said, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? I love this. This is rich right here. Because Jesus is good. Amen. I said, Jesus is good. But he said, why'd you call me good? Because there were a lot of folks who were standing around in the way and they could hear what Jesus said. And there were many in that day who longed to accuse Jesus. And had Jesus just received such accolades as good master, there would have been a religious crowd around him who would have said, there's nobody good but God. Well, Jesus is God. He could have very well just said, yes, I'm good. But instead of getting into a secondary discussion that was irrelevant to what this young man wanted, he just said, there's none good but God. I love that Jesus, listen to this, he was more interested in answering this young man's question than he was having a debate about who he We ought to learn from Jesus and realize there's some arguments we really don't need to waste our time on. There's some issues that we have just spent way too much energy on when there is nothing that compares to answering the question, what must I do to inherit your life? Jesus looked at him and he said, well, you know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not steal. Honor thy father. And he just kind of runs down a few of the commandments that all of those in that day, the Jews especially, would have known the commandments. And this young man, I can almost see that he jumps in while Jesus is talking. He said, hey, hey, wait just a minute. I've done all that. <laughs> I've already kept those commandments. I did that since I was a kid because I would go down to the synagogue and they would teach us about the commandments of the Lord. And he said, I've done that. Well, we live in such a day that there's a lot of folks who believe they've done enough to have eternal life in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm good enough. I've done enough. And, and listen, don't act like that, that doesn't include many of us in the church because sometimes we even look at other people who die and because they were good, they were a good neighbor or, or they were a good friend or a co-worker or a classmate, we automatically put them in heaven. But ladies and gentlemen, good people don't inherit eternal life. I don't care how good you think you are or what you've done. We have church folk who go to church every day. They've been going all their life and nine months before, but there was never anything that happened in their life. 
except they went to church. And going to church won't make you a Christian. Going to church won't make you a Christian any more than sitting in your garage will make you a car. Now, you might smell like a car if you'll sit out there long enough, but it won't make you a car. Do you hear what I'm saying? Going to church is not where we inherit eternal life. And so Jesus is helping this young man upset. He said, why did he say keep the commandments? Because those who love the Lord do live in obedience to his command. I said, those who love the Lord do live in obedience to his command. And you know what he says about that? He said, to obey him is not burdens. Amen. It's a blessing to live in obedience to God, not a burden. Amen. Don't shout me down. Amen. And so, <laughs> amen. Y'all all right, aren't you? And so Jesus said, keep the commandments because he knew where this young man was and he was wanting him to understand that it's not about these things that you have done. And we live in such a day where people think, if I'm just a little bit better than a man bad, then I'm going to make it to heaven. And ladies and gentlemen, that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm not a bad person. I don't run around with bad people. I don't do bad things. I don't talk bad. That has nothing to do with it. What's your motivation for those things? Well, I just do it because I'm going to be a good person. Great! You succeeded. You're a good person. And I remind you tonight that hell will be full of good people for eternity. Keep the command. Oh, I've done that, Jesus. There may be some in this very room who feel like you've done enough. You ought to go to heaven because you're not as bad as some folks. I mean, I mean, really, I look around and I'm better than a lot of people. Now, we don't say that out loud, but we think it. No. I love when I witness to somebody and they'll say, well, I'm as good as you, preacher. <laughs> you know what I normally like to say? Good. That'll get you to hell. Because <laughs> I'm not the standard. And when you think of yourself as better than somebody else, I got news for you. You're not the standard. I've done all that, Lord. So in this encounter with Jesus, the Bible tells us some very important things in verse 21. Then Jesus behold me. Would you notice when we hear this young man who's run out with Jesus, he's asking for about eternal life out of here, and the Bible said Jesus beholding him. Let, let me bring that into to a, a, a 2023 word. How about that, all right? He looked at it. I said he looked at it. Now, we could just rush over that, but let's stop for just a minute and look at it, because Jesus looked at him. Have you ever talked to anybody who was looking at you? You ever talk to anybody who what? Boy, I've talked to some folks, you know. I go up and I say, hey, I'm Rock Collins. They're like, oh, nice to meet you. Man, we're glad you're here. Yeah. And they're looking around to see who else they can see. That makes me feel very important, doesn't it, you? <laughs> I try to look at people when I talk to them. So I like for folks to look at me when, I, when they talk to me because they are giving me their attention. I feel like we're communicating. That's a problem I have today with like social media, like, like even texting. Because you can't read my nonverbal communication. I can see you something on text and be smiling and you get it and think I'm mad. I'm just saying that to tell you Jesus wasn't texting with the boy. <laughs> He looked at him. He gave him his attention. But not only did he give him his attention, but watch this. He looked at him. I mean, Jesus wasn't looking around to see who else was there. He wasn't trying to find the next conversation. He wasn't looking to sign an autograph with somebody else. He just looked at this young man. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, that the apostle John, the eye of the path, saw the Lord, his hair was white like wool, and his eyes, you remember, were a flame of fire. Can, can I tell you, when Jesus looks at you, he sees you. He saw this young man 
not just who he was on the outside. He saw who he was. Ladies and gentlemen, when King Jesus looks at you, he sees you. You can't hide. I said you can't hide because you are completely revealed when Jesus looks at you. He knows everything about you. He knows everywhere you've been. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything you've said. He knows every thought you've had. He knows every sin you've committed. He knows every time you rejected him. He knows every time you turned your back on him. He knows everything. He knows the number of hair on your head. There's nothing about you he doesn't know. When he looked at this young man, he saw him right where he was, and he gave him his undivided attention. Ladies and gentlemen, King Jesus is here tonight, and he is looking at you. And he sees everything about you. There is nothing you can hide from him. There is nothing you can keep back from him. There is nothing you can explain away. Because he knows it. Well, you don't understand, preacher. I just did that because of the situation. He knows the situation, and he knows the motive of your heart. King David wrote the psalm, Search me, O God, and know me. Oh, to God that you and I here tonight would stop for just a moment and say, God, would you search my heart? I find myself as a follower of Christ often praying and saying, dear God, would you search me and would you reveal to me anything that doesn't look like you so I can confess it as sin? Jesus sees you. Some of you feel like nobody sees you. You feel like you're invisible. Nobody ever looks at you when they talk to you because they're always looking for somebody else. You seem to feel always like you're looked over, looked past, or looked around. Maybe it's by those around you as friends or so-called acquaintances. Maybe it's by even your family. I don't know, but maybe you feel looked over. I'm going to tell you something. King Jesus is here tonight, and he sees Did Jesus be holding him? When you have an encounter with Jesus, he'll look at you and he'll see everything about you. The Bible said Jesus be holding him loved him. My Lord, that's rich right there. Listen, Jesus looked at him. He saw him for who he was. He knew everything about him. He thought it was good. He had done my good. He thought it was good enough for heaven, for eternal life. And Jesus looked at him. He knew all that about him. And the next words say he loved him. Well, isn't that good? You know why that's so good? Because Jesus saw him in all of his faults, all of his sins, all of his shortcuts, all of his misunderstandings, all of his thinking that he was good enough. Jesus saw him knowing he wasn't good enough, seeing him for who he was, but he loved him anyway. Is anybody here tonight? He loved him anyway. Makes me think of that woman called adultery. They came out there to stone her, threw her in front of Jesus. What are you going to say? And Jesus looked at her and loved her. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How about that woman at the well who came up there to see him? There she was, a woman who had had five husbands. She was shacked up with the one she is with now. And she comes down there and Jesus showed her love. What about Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector? Yeah, he was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he? Amen. Y'all know that. And, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree to the hope of Jesus to see. Listen, Jesus went to his house and loved him. And we can go on and on and on and time after time after time. Jesus saw those where they were. He recognized their situation. And he loved them. I just came by tonight to tell you Jesus is here and he has seen you. He's looking at you even now. He knows everything about you. You hid nothing from him. He knows your motives, your plans, everything. He knows what you think or don't think. He knows! And he loves you. I 
said he loves you. In 1 John, the book says, herein is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. Hey, hey, hey don't run around and say, well, I love God. I'm out in front of him. No, no, no. He loved you before you ever loved him. Here is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us, listen, and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Ladies and gentlemen, God so loved you, God so loved you, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, who would go to a cross on Calvary, nails would pierce his hands and his feet, a spear pierce his side, a crown of thorns pierce his brow, and on the cross of Calvary, shed his life's blood. And he said, whosoever believes that my death on the cross is sufficient to forgive him of his sin, I will forgive him. I love the way one of my favorite authors, Mike Cicado, said it. It is Jesus who could rather die than live without you. 
Can I tell you something, friend? When Jesus looks at you and he sees everything, I know you got to hear from me. You got to hear from folks around right? you. You got to hear from your family. You got to hear from your friends and coworkers. But they don't know all the other stuff about you that Jesus knows. He knows everything and he still loves you. Some of you are afraid to let some stuff get out about you because there are some people that won't, not only will they not love you, they won't even like you. And Jesus knows everything and he loves you anyway. So God sent his son who died on the cross and shed his life's blood and said, I'll forgive you your sin. Three days later, he rose from a borrowed tomb victorious and he said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the one who died and shed his blood for your sin, the one who was laid in the borrowed tomb and rose from death, if you believe and confess it, you will be saved. Don't you dare leave this place tonight and feel like nobody cares about you. Because God loves you. And He cares about you. And He wants what's best for you. Jesus looked at him. Jesus loved him. And the Bible said, Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Jesus looked at him, he saw him for who he was. Jesus loved him, even though he saw him for who he was, and Jesus left him with him. You know what that means? He told him the truth. I said he told him the truth. Some folks will be happy if we just tickle ears and say, oh, everything's good, everything's great, let me just tickle your ears. You didn't get that one tonight, I'm sorry. Because I wanted to come and be like Jesus and tell you the truth. Jesus looked at this young man and he said, you're lacking one thing. Can I start right there? Wouldn't it be a shame to go to hell because you only lack one thing? Wouldn't it be a shame to miss heaven over just one thing? Jesus said, you're lacking one thing. I'm sure his ears perked up because he thought he was pretty good. He said, I kept the commandments since I was a kid. I'm pretty good. Yeah. And Jesus said, but you're still lacking something. And I'm sure his ears perked up and he's wondering, what am I liking? And Jesus said, sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come take up the cross and follow me. What's that mean? Well, I know what it means, preacher. It means you can't have stuff and follow Jesus. That's not what it means. I want you to listen to me, friend. This has little to do with the stuff. Now, don't act like you don't know what stuff I'm talking about. Because y'all like stuff. Don't you? You don't have to say, man, I know I'm telling the truth. You know how I know I'm telling the truth? Because some of you will get up early on Saturday morning and you'll go down to the road where somebody has pulled a bunch of stuff out of their house into the yard to have the stuff set. They got so much stuff, they're going to sell some of their stuff. And you think you need some more stuff, so you go down to the stuff sale and buy some more stuff from somebody else, so you can bring it back and have more stuff at your house. And then in a few weeks, you say, I'm going to have to have stuff sell at my house because I got too much stuff. <laughs> hey, have I got close yet? <laughs> hey, here's the truth. Okay, here's the, we all got stuff. We all got stuff. And God looked at this young man and he said, you got a lot of stuff. Sell it. Give it away. And come follow me. You mean, preacher, we got to sell all our stuff? If your stuff is your God, absolutely. Amen. See, Stuff 
that God may bless you with. But if you live for that stuff, you don't really have much life. Because I want to tell you something, you can get all the stuff in the world but it's never satisfied. Jesus looked at him and said, go sell all your stuff and just give it to the poor. Come and take up your cross. See, Jesus, when he calls us, it's not just to say, well, I believe there's a God. I believe he sent his son to die and he rose from there. Okay, I'm saved. No, that's not what it means. It's not a just giving some lip service and saying you believe something. Listen, the demons believe in Jesus. But it's when you surrender everything. See, when the Lord calls us to come follow him, he bids us, as David Bonhoeffer said, he bids us come and die. Because we come and say everything else is worthless compared to knowing Jesus. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I've done it all. <laughs> he said, I've been a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I've been the most religious of all. I've done it all. He said, all of my works I count as dumb, as refuse, just compared to knowing Jesus. Jesus looked at this young man and said, you got to get rid of your stuff because your stuff is your God and you love it too much. Yeah. you got to get rid of that which you put before me. And it says in verse 22, and he was sad at that saying. Now, now listen to me a minute, listen to me. I don't want you to think I, I misused the text here. It says that he was sad at that saying. I know the he that is referenced is the young man who's talking to Jesus. I know that. But when I read that, I not only see that young man was sad, but I believe Jesus was sad. That's just what college you do with it what you want. If you don't want to believe that, that's fine. Do what you want. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. Amen about that. Because I believe Jesus. Heartbroken over those who have rejected The Bible said he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. This young man said to Jesus, I kept the commandments, and I thought I was a pretty good dude. I thought I was doing the right things, and I was sure I'd be good enough for heaven, but you're asking a little much. If you want me to abandon everything I have for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is asking us, abandon everything you have for you. I want to ask you, what do you love tonight more than you love Jesus? Somebody here tonight may have never met Jesus. You know, I don't love Jesus. But you got a lot of stuff in your life you love. And let me ask you, how's that working out for you? How is that satisfying you in the darkness of the night? How does that bring you peace when you're having troubles? How are you satisfied with your stuff? How do you work through that idea of knowing you're not loved and cared about? You have to be a certain way or do a certain thing in order to be accepted and, and loved by others. You don't know what it's like to be loved with an unconditional love based on who Jesus is, not on who you are. What is it you're grasping in your hand? Holding those so tightly that's keeping you from having a relationship with Jesus. What is it that you love more Follower of Christ, Christian brother, sister, what in your life are you holding on to that has taken a more prominent place in your life than the person of Jesus Christ? I can answer the question for you. If you spell L-O-V-E, love, T-I-M-E, we just have to look at what you're spending most of your time on and know what you love the most. We could take a look at your checkbook. Okay, that's kind of outdated. We'd have to go online and look up your bank account. <laughs> and see where you're investing most of your riches. And we can tell the things you love. When a lost world looks at you, what do they see in you that you 
loved the most. Jesus said, get rid of everything that you put in a more prominent place than me. Because ladies and gentlemen, one of these sweet days, King Jesus is going to call the church home. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to hear me hear me clear. The only thing that will matter is your relationship with him. That's it. So who is this for, preacher? Who is this for? I'm glad you had. Because the Bible said if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And on the third day God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And that very same chapter of Romans chapter 10, move down to verse 13, it says, For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Preacher, you don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done, but I know what he did. And you don't know how bad I've been. Oh, but you don't know how good he's been. Listen, you can compare all day how bad a thing you have done, but I'm going to tell you nothing compared to the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Who can more? Who can be saved? I submit to you that he can save anybody. He'll save whosoever calls upon his name. Why, he can save the atheist and the agnostic. He can save the blind and the belligerent to truth. He can save the corrupt and the crooked. He can save the doubter and the drunkard. He can save the educated and the evildoer. He can save the fake and the fallen. He can save the greedy and the guilty. He can save the hearted and the hellion. He can save the indifferent, the ignorant, the illegitimate. He can save the joker. He can save the jester. He can save the king. He can save the bad man. He can save the misunderstood. He can save your neighbor. He can save our nation. He can save the oppressed. He can save the ostracized. He can save the prisoner. He can save the prideful. He can save the pretender. I'm telling you, there's nobody Jesus can save. And so tonight as I stand before you, I'm not here to just give you a list of who he can save. I'm here to tell you, he can save you tonight. Preach, I didn't come to hear all this stuff. I, I just came to hear Ben Wade because I'd seen him on America's Got Talent. I'm not here for this. Hey, you might have just come to see Brother Ben and you were blessed by him, but God had plans to meet you here. Hello? And friend, if you've never met Jesus, tonight's your night. Tonight, I tell you what, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until I get back to my church. That's a great idea. You just can't guarantee me you're ever going to get back to Oh, yeah, I got plans. I, I, I'll be there next week. You got plans. But God's in control. And He sure changed my plans many times. So tonight I want to be real plain and real simple. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose from the dead. He said, Repent of your sin. Do you know that's basically what he said to this young man? Go sell all you got, give it to the poor, take up the crop. See, for him, his stuff was what he was worshiping. And Jesus said, Turn your back on that stuff and turn your eyes on the Savior. Hey, that's what he's calling us to do. Because, see, we'll walk in life this way, we'll live in our sin, we'll live for ourselves. We'll seek our own satisfaction. And somewhere along the way, and maybe it's tonight, you've realized that you're really not satisfied with life. And so you turn your back on that sin and on that seeking your own self-satisfaction and turn your eyes on the Savior and realize He satisfies completely. That's repentance. You heard it from the praise day. You heard it from Brother Ben. Now you hear it from me. Jesus saves. Would you come to him tonight? Would you accept Jesus tonight? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. I'm going to ask you to walk down here and just stand right here in front of you. Just stand there. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, I'm going to ask you to come and stand. 
But before I do that, I want to ask you about your head and attitude and prayer. If tonight you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's never been a time that you said, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. There's never been a time that you said, Lord, I want to turn from my sin and turn to you. Tonight's your night. I'm going to pray a prayer. You can pray something similar to this. You can put it in your own words. It's not the power of my words. It's the power of your prayer to ask Jesus to come into your heart. You can just pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And I choose Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the dead on the third day. Would you come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and be Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You prayed that prayer tonight. You asked Jesus to come into your heart. Just a moment, I want you to come up here. Just making a strong confession that you're following Jesus. I've got some counselors who are going to want to sit down and share some information with you. But they're not going to make you go outside, shave your head, and sell roses in the parking lot or nothing like that. But they just want to share some information that will help you understand what you've done to them. If you invited Jesus into your heart, I want to invite you to come just a moment. Just be bold enough to stand up and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. You do have an option. You can be like this young man and you can go away sad. Can I tell you, I never read another word about this young man in the scripture. I never read where he changes his mind and comes after Jesus. I never read it. Tonight's your mind. Don't let the story of your life be you went away sad. Everybody in the house, stand on your feet. If you pray to ask Jesus into your heart tonight, would you just start putting him down here right now? Just come and stand here. Just come and stand. If you ask Jesus into your heart, come on down here tonight. Just come and stand. Just come on. Come on. If you pray and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. Not choose Jesus. Come on. Is there anybody else? Else. He didn't ask me to do this, but I'm going to do this. Y'all know Jim, he's our DO in here. Can we give him a hand for all he does for our church? I didn't ask him to really, really have to do it. But uh, I spent a few hours with Jim. Uh, one day it was, one day it was me. And this man loves Jesus. He loves Jesus. You can see it in his, in his I was sitting in your office. I was noticing all the different training certificates. This man is trained so much. He's tried to find every way to share Jesus with people, whether it's Spanish, whether it's sign language, whether whatever it is, this man loves Jesus. And I want to beg you as, as part of our association that we can pray for him on a daily. Can we do that? Amen. We love you. I just want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, I've been blessed, and I hope you've been blessed by what's been here and what's taking place. Uh, truly, the Spirit's had His way. Uh, we've had people who recognize that they needed to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. We've had people who said, I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord. And if it's just one, it's worth it. <laughs> worth it all. Thank you all for supporting us, supporting your association. It's not me. Association, I work for you. Anything I can do, if you ask, I'll try my best to get it done. Can't do everything. I'm not Jesus. Jesus can do everything. And so through prayer and work with Him, and let Him have control. It'll happen. But uh, God bless you all. And uh, we love you. And Jesus loves you.